Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored at opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio and iTunes and Stitcher and Progressive Radio Network, and at opednews.com slash podcasts. I'm excited about my guest today. Uh, this is uh, Sujasa Fernandez, and she's got a new book out called Curated Stories, The Uses and Misuses of Storytelling. Now, I've been interested in stories for a long time, about 20 years. And uh, I guess about 16 years ago, I started, a, a con I organized and ran a conference that ran for six years, StoryCon, the summit meeting on the art, science, and application of stories. Uh, and so I'm, I've really got a commitment to stories and, and your book is the first to really challenge that stories can be abused. Now, so I want to introduce you a little bit more first. Su Sujatha Fernandez is a professor of political economy and sociology at the University of Sydney. She was previously a professor of psych sociology at the City University of New York and was a member of the Princeton Society of Fellows. She's written for the New York Times, The Nation, and Dissent, among other publications. And she's the author of four books. The most recent, the subject of this interview, is titled Curated Stories, The Uses and Misuses of Storytelling. And in a way, your book describes the gentrification of stories, I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Just as neighborhoods are taken over, exploited, and homogenized for profit, usually starting out with the introduction of the arts, the world of story is going through a similar gentrification process that is exploiting stories and using them through a process of curation. And, you know, I... I, I, in, in reading the book, I realized that maybe my conference on the application of story, which I was very proud of because it was the first time that I brought together all the different worlds of story. Mm -hmm. I had come to realize that story was much bigger than just storytelling and novels and movies and books, that it was also religion and politics and marketing as well, that it was one of the biggest industries in, in, in the world after mm -hmm. transportation, actually. Uh, but you've really gotten into uh, explaining how story can be abused. And I think that's really powerful. And I, and listening to one of your interviews, uh, you, you pointed out how you didn't start out trying to write a, a book challenging the use of stories. You started out looking at writing a book on how to use stories. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to make sure that we spend some of the time in this interview exploring your concerns with story and how it's being abused, particularly for a neoliberal narrative. But also I want to get into the other side of it is what's the right way to use stories and how do we use stories to make change happen? Mm -hmm. So uh, can you start off by telling us a story maybe about Malala Yousafzai and then define what you mean by curated stories? Mm -hmm. well, well, her story um, as, you know, the girl who got shot in the head by the Taliban for trying to get an education, right? That's the kind of narrative that we see often in the Western media used to describe Malala, um, is the one I open the book with, because I think the ways in which her story has been um, taken, told, curated, retold, um, you know, really become a kind of iconic story for um, girls who simply want to get an education, it's kind of an example of my argument about the ways in which people's complex, interesting, um, complicated stories get sort of refined and ultimately um, completely sort of dumbed down and then repurposed for the uses of things like a media who wants to declare war on the Taliban, who wants to um, justify US intervention and occupation in um, Afghanistan for various political ends and utilitarian purposes, these stories um, get shorn of their kind of complexity in order to fit these more simplistic kind of agendas. Hey, I know I, I do some consulting. I work with uh, politicians sometimes to help them identify stories in their lives that they can use to wrap their issues around because I think that stories help people to help help the people telling them to touch the listeners' hearts more mm -hmm. effectively, which is, a, I think, much more powerful. Mm -hmm. And stories have that power. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 they're almost just like drugs that can be used or abused, really. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking in the light of what you've written. Mm 
Um, so uh, it, what you talk about at one point is, is the idea of this, this top down direction of stories from nonprofits and foundations or political organizations or, or, or the system. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to, because I, the show is a bottom up show. I think that what you're saying without using the word is that what gets cut out of stories is the bottom up part of stories, mm -hmm. the, the, the connection to people's lives, to community. Mm -hmm. um, you use the word collective as a, as a, as a, and describe how that is neglected or, or mm -hmm. hidden in the stories. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of contextualizing it in terms of the show. Right. So I use um, the work of an oral historian called Alessandro Portelli, and he talks about how there are different dimensions to stories. He says there's the personal dimension, there's the collective dimension, and there's the political dimension. The personal dimension is just about our everyday lives. It's about um, marriage and birth of children and, um, you know, the, the sort of trajectory of the individual's personal life and the things that happen to them. And then there's a collective and that we're all situated within networks and communities, whether it's school, work, home, whatever it is, we have these different network family. We have these different community networks and collective networks in which we live and which shape our lives. Um, and then there's the political. There are the political events that shape our lives. There is perhaps political involvement for some people. Um, there's the broader political context. And what Portelli argues is that when people tell stories, they just automatically shift between these different levels. They'll talk about, you know, maybe the birth of a child and then they'll talk about their um, extended family and then they may refer to the president or, you know, there are ways in which people continually shift among these different levels. And, and the argument that I make in the book is that this boom of curated storytelling, this shift away from... Um, the sort of complex stories that people tell about their lives to these more utilitarian stories has meant getting rid of those collective and political dimensions and focusing mostly on the personal, which means that everything becomes much more individualized so that unlike the women's movement who talked about, say, women getting up at consciousness raising sessions and talking about an abusive husband and linking that to a broader patriarchal structure in society, Today at a legal hearing, a legal story, we may just hear, my husband was terrible, this is what he did to me. Or the domestic worker talking about my terrible employer who was really bad and abused me in this way. It becomes very personal and individual and that broader collective structural element that earlier movements like the women's movement talked about, uh, with these kind of curated stories, those elements just drop out. And you, you use uh, the example you, you use a couple of different examples. Uh, um, one is uh, the, the, the dreamers yeah. and how they were kind of exploited. Mm -hmm. talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I, I think, yes, I'm, I do make the argument that so the undocumented student dreamer movement that used stories in their uh, campaign for a dream bill that would enable them to get citizenship, to, to get a, um, work permits and to have... Um, the ability to stay legally in the country and pursue higher education. Um, I argue that, yes, they were exploited by advocacy organisations and others to tell this, these really simplistic narratives in order to um, support the campaign. But I also argue that it's, you know, they were also somewhat complicit in that being, uh, envisaging themselves as different kind of migrants, not the sort of anonymous working class labourer who didn't necessarily envisage staying in the country as compared to the stories that were told through this campaign, which were stories of, you know, I came here through no fault of my own. My parents were the ones who brought me illegally. Um, I got to high school and then I realized I didn't have a social security number. I couldn't go on to college. Um, you know, I am one of, you know, America's brightest and talented who America will benefit from having me and that's why I, we need to pass a dream act. These were the kind of formulaic stories that the students told through the campaign and they were stories that they were encouraged to tell and in the sort of backlash to that that happened say um, in the 2010s uh, a lot of these students said you know they didn't want to have to blame their parents they didn't want to have to set themselves against both their parents who had brought them here seeking a better life for them and against um, uh, 
uh, you know, creating a class division between themselves as upwardly mobile, best and brightest um, kind of valedictorians versus the, um, the, the, the those who are stigmatized as foreign, um, who are stigmatized as never, you know, wanting to or able to belong here. And, um, and so there was, by the 2010s, there was much more critique of that type of storytelling. Some of these students even refuse to tell their stories anymore. And I think that's one of the things we saw happening is that over time people began to reject storytelling as a movement technique because they said ultimately we're very hamstrung by the kinds of stories that we are able to tell. And um, so if that's all we're able to tell, then we're going to withhold our stories sort of as a form of resistance against this curated storytelling. It makes me think of the work of uh, Cormac Russell. He has, uh, he works with communities, he calls it asset, asset based community development. Mm. And uh, it's based, a, lot, a lot of it's based on the work of John McKnight. Uh, the idea that most consultants who work to go into communities end up exploiting the communities. Mm -hmm. They take all the money and they become the top down experts telling them what to do. And the right way to do it is to empower the communities, and give them the tools to identify who their strong people are and the leaders are and tap the assets. And, and, and it sounds like that's what's missing when th these institutions come in and use people for their stories to promote the message of the institution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that was the big critique is that the domestic workers, the dreamers, all of these people who participated in these campaigns who were brought out over and over and over to tell their stories at rallies at at legal hearings, to the media, the same story over and over and over to senators, at, you know, the legislature. They just said, okay, at the end of all of this, who did this benefit? Really, the only people that benefited was the advocacy organisations themselves because those organisations were able to um, get the social capital from, you know, putting out these campaigns. They were able to, um, you know... Uh, um, launch themselves into bigger organizations. They were able to get a lot of funding. That happened with the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, where Domestic Workers United went from a small, sort of largely self funded organization to one that um, transmuted into the National Domestic Workers Alliance, gaining about $5 million a year from foundations like the Ford Foundation. And so the domestic workers said, okay, where do we come out of all of this? At the end of the day, what did we get? We got a very weak bill that was not implemented that now has really made little difference in our lives. Meanwhile, the people who launched the campaign are at the head of these million dollar, you know, advocacy organizations. And so a lot of people are asking that question, right? Like what is telling our story actually earned us really very little. And so um, that's where the, the, the criticism has come in. That's interesting because I was just last weekend at a uh, peace and uh, peace and justice uh, studies conference for for basically professors who teach peace and justice mm. and one of the first comments after a talk was that nonprofits and foundations are sabotaging mm. activists mm -hmm. and it sounds like that's exactly what you're describing you you talk about how storytelling may actually circumscribe the goals of marginalized groups and limit their chances of securing real social change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's, so I'm, I'm, discuss, I'm talking here about a very specific kind of advocacy storytelling with the case of the domestic workers and the dreamers. And I do think from what I've observed, like, I mean, like you said at the beginning of the interview, when I went into this, I was going to write a book about how great it was the use of stories in the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights campaign. Because, I mean, I do also believe that uh, adding the human dimension into a particular issue rather than just a list of numbers and statistics to add the human dimension in to communicate something personal and human about that story can really grab people's attention and um, can really kind of help them understand what's at stake in an issue because you're telling them what's at stake for an individual and that has a resonance. It has a really emotional resonance with people. That's why I wanted to start this project was to really show how that kind of storytelling could, could be effective. But it's when I went to reach out and talk to the domestic workers and the dreamers and hear their stories, it's not the, it's not the narrative they told me. It's not how they describe their own experiences.
And, and what you learned was they were kind of angry and they didn't want to tell their stories anymore because they felt exploited and used. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. So you, you say that stories are being used to support a neoliberal status quo, often using personalized stories at the price of ignoring collective and political modes of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Define, because I, I like your, your, your way you characterize it, define neoliberalism and how stories are being used to help it metastasize. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so we, when I talk about neoliberalism, I'm talking about the particular kind of free market era where uh, we've seen massive cutbacks to social security, to, to sort of social welfare, to um, all kinds of social programs. We've seen the expansion of, um, of, of things like free trade, of um, uh, just a, a mindset that seeks to pare down the redistributive government, governmental state that, that wants to help people and, and expands privatization um, and seeks everybody to sort of help themselves, right? A pull yourself up by the bootstraps type of ideology has become very, very strong in this period. Um, and so the reason why I see storytelling as being really key in, um, in, this, in this neoliberal era is because uh, many organizations, many movements at this moment have kind of um, bought into this, into this neoliberal ideology that the best way forward for people is not necessarily through community, it's not necessarily through um, mass-based organizing, it's through a kind of social mobility of people helping themselves, of people rising up themselves individually and um, improving their own social circumstances. So those narratives, in all the cases I look at, in the case of the um, Afghan women, for instance, and a writing project, a creative writing project with them, sponsored by the State Department, with the dreamers, with the domestic workers, we see this narrative over and this neoliberal narrative of over and over of, um, in the case of the domestic workers, they're presented as a niche group who, um, who the American economy, the New York economy depends on very heavily. In the case of the dreamers, we're seen as this, you know, they're seen as this best and brightest upwardly mobile. All they need is for the obstacles in their way to be removed so that they can, you know, continue following in the path of earlier immigrants. And this is always used in these campaigns too, is it? Well, the earlier European immigrants did it, they managed to have some sense of social mobility. So today's immigrants can do it too, but not all of them, not all 10 million undocumented immigrants, only those who are a niche group like domestic workers, those who are um, the best and the brightest, like the dreamers, um, or the sort of elite group of Afghan women who were recruited by the State Department for this project, who are seen as the sort of neoliberal entrepreneurs that will bring Afghanistan into a new future. So, so what you're saying is this is really, this use of story is really a kind of neoliberal propaganda. You don't basically. use that word, but it seems yeah. like that's really basically. what we're talking about. Right, right. It is. It's a neoliberal propaganda, neoliberal ideology in which, and, and this is a crucial point, I don't think that the people who tell the stories are simply being exploited. I think they become agents themselves in promoting this ideology and in beginning to see themselves in fundamentally different ways as entrepreneurs, as upwardly mobile, as believing that among all others, they are deserving of these kinds of special rights. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, we see a whole lot of them reject that. As I said, it's not that they just simply absorb this and then start promoting it, but that's the, that's the sort of aim of this neoliberal project, is to recruit large numbers of people to think of themselves in these terms as individuals who are upwardly mobile, who can kind of pull themselves up out of poverty, out of difficult circumstances, um, and ultimately um, triumph over their circumstances. But it's this very heroic individualist kind of narrative. You talk about Gramsci's transformismo and the Obama campaign to neutralize movements and activate pissed energy. And in a way, storytelling is used to narrow and weaken collective power and agency. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's intentional? Um, I think it comes from a particular political strategy, right? It's a political strategy strategy that relates to what you said earlier about experts, about the idea that experts know best for people and they know best for people um, how, you know, how they should live their lives, how they should um, act as political actors. And this, this kind of 
expert line was one that said, instead of building collective power on the ground, what we need is experts who can be voted into office and who can make decisions on behalf of people that are going to benefit them. And so all of these, the, the Dreamer Act, the, um, the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights Act, um, the idea of comprehensive immigration reform, that was also very much a part of the, of the Dreamer campaign where, um, where often the Dreamers were also recruited into that, uh, that, that campaign for comprehensive immigration reform. They all relied on the idea that since Obama was in office, he was somebody who could once voted in, carry out all this change. And therefore, the kinds of goals that were being set during this period, during the Obama years, the, during those his two terms, were one, vote the right people into office, two, vote for the right bills. And to me, those are very, very narrow goals. Um, and to me, it's precisely in demobilizing people and in demobilizing that coll collective action that I feel we end up in the situation we're in today because... Um, because all of those actors were, instead of mobilizing on the ground in the way that the 2006 mega marches did during 2006, immigrants across the country, undocumented immigrants who were told that they were too weak to mobilize, that they were too scared, that they, you know, that they couldn't do anything because they were undocumented, they took to the streets and they had major marches and mobilizations across the country. And it was through the foundations, it was through the Obama administration, it was through all of these different ways that that collective power was gradually kind of um, co-opted into the administration. And today, when we need it most, um, so much of social activism is still controlled by these foundations. You know, I find interesting, I've been researching the uh, principles and values of conservatism recently. Mm -hmm. And one of the main elements in conservatism is opposition to communism. Mm -hmm. Not surprising, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it ends up that the concept of collectivism is equated to communism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really not surprising that in the creation of these narratives that promote the neoliberal agenda, and, and Obama is certainly a neoliberal, mm -hmm. They're, they're cutting out the collective element of it. Mm -hmm. it, it. It's like stripping out the parts that keep people connected to people. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in a sense, I, 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 it's hard for me not to think about Paulo Freire in a lot of my interviews. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, that what you're describing is, is oppressed people taking on the thinking of the oppressors. That's mm -hmm. pretty much what you described in, in them being coached to tell these stories, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and, and this is where I think the book is also making an intervention, is that so often with this kind of storytelling, there's an authenticity given to people telling their own stories, right? So it's like, well, it's not somebody else telling their story, it's they from their own mouths talking about their true life experiences. And there's a kind of... Um, you know, a kind of extra value given to the fact that somebody is telling their own story. But what I'm trying to point out in the book is simply having someone telling their own story doesn't mean that it can give us an unmediated window onto their real true life experiences unless we look at all the things that shape the ways that story is told. So, for instance, when a domestic worker tells a story in a legal setting, there is um, a protocol that they have to follow. They're directed to tell only what are their wages and conditions. They're not asked to tell what are the global conditions of the domestic work industry. They're not asked to talk about that. And I think that is what makes it so much more pernicious. Mm -hmm, this exactly. Structured storytelling, uh, because what they're doing is they're forcing them to strip out the marrow of right. the story, as, as Emerson would have described it, mm -hmm. as the part where they're connected to the hearts of their people and their community, really. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this was the critique of, of people. For instance, I talk in the book about TED Talks and the ways that um, TED Talks are an example of an extremely curated story. They appear that the person on the stage is completely natural and spontaneous. It's <laughs> And yet it is the, the product of, you know, a New Yorker article actually talked about this, a product of over and over and over rehearsing, curating, coming up with the exact camera angles for the person. Um, and, you know, and, and the use of these kind of TED uh, um, techniques within, say, the Dreamer movement, 
um, where people are told, don't talk about your community, talk about yourself, don't cut out all this stuff. They're told what to include and what to cut out, leaving, you know, as one dreamer said, you know, or one, one of the students said, leaving just these heroic singular narratives that don't point to who I am as part of a broader community, but just see me as an individual. Yeah. So we need to take a break uh, for identifying the show. I'm just going to pause now because we'll do the radio and edit in a bumper for the, the break. Sure. Okay, so I, I want to make sure that we spend time talking about the solution. Yeah. Because that's where you wanted to start. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we need, to, you, you talk about the need to move from curated stories to mobilizing stories. Mm -hmm. So talk about that more. Yeah. Well, I think we have a really important precedent in terms of mobilizing stories. So I think, yes. Uh, curated stories and mobilizing stories, they can both be utilitarian, but in different ways. And so if we go back to the period of the 1960s and 70s, and we look at an era where there were sort of these more mass based, broad social movements that existed at that time from the women's movement, the farm workers movement, um, movements in, such as indigenous movements across, across regions like Latin America. When we look at that era of broader mobilization, they did use stories in uh, what I see as a really effective way for mobilizing people. So, for instance, as I talked about earlier, the women's movement um, used consciousness raising tactics where they uh, told stories that linked to a broader critique of patriarchy that led to a broader critique of capitalism. Um, the, the black power movement, the farm workers movement, the one-on-one -on -one storytelling used in the farm workers movement was, was also very effective in um, each person telling their story to other people and, and in that way uh, sharing the kind of abuses and exploitations that took place in the industry with an eye to campaigning against those kind of abuses. Um, another example is um, what's called testimonial, which was testimonies told in Latin America where often um, uh, activists from the north would come down to countries like Guatemala or um, Mexico and they would record the stories of those who were um, the victims of, um, of, of contra operations by the United States, for instance. So, um, uh, or who were under, under siege by US supported armies in their country, like indigenous movements. Um, they told their stories and in telling their stories and then those uh, visitors from America or wherever would record, edit their stories, would release their stories. So for instance, the one of the most famous one of these testimonials is I Rigoberta Menchu. That story sold millions of copies and actually helped to bring an end to the civil war in Guatemala, helped to bring an end to the abuses by the, um, the Guatemalan army against, against the indigenous people. Um, and it's also partly because the way that story was told, it was told very much in all its complexity um, and uh, nuance about the lives of indigenous people, but linking that to their struggle, to the collective um, guerrilla movement that existed at the time. And also then pointing out the causes, pointing out how um, the government was really instrumental in, um, and then the support from the US government was instrumental in, in the genocide of indigenous people that was taking place, the killing off of large numbers of people in the name of fighting the guerrilla movement. Um, and so those to me are just examples from our recent past of how stories can be used in a really empowering way to um, draw attention to social struggles, to uh, try to challenge the, the powers that be, challenge um, structural inequality uh, in much deeper ways. And, and I, I trace in the book how over time those movements became co-opted. Like you said, they became gentrified by um, truth commissions, for instance, in the aftermath of all the atrocities that happened in, in Latin America and how slowly and um, um, talk about talk about the truth commissions because uh, you you mentioned in your book how yeah, important that yeah. how they used stories and abused them. Yeah, so, so I mean, so the truth commissions, which happened um, after you know in in periods from and places from South Africa to Guatemala to effort to um, uh, all over Latin America, where dictators had been in power, where there had been massive tortures and abuses and killings of and disappearances of activists. Um, in the aftermath of those um, periods, 
Truth Commission sort of came as a way to both restore the liberal order, but also usher in a neoliberal order. This is what various scholars have argued. That's the role that they played, is to try to convince people, okay, there was a massive, uh, you know, uh, um, assault here on progressive forces. There were so many people who were killed, but we can kind of overlook that and we can work together and we can move into a new era. It was in some ways the way they acted in the end was not to bring justice to the families or the people who were killed or disappeared, but rather to paper over and to transition into a neoliberal order. So it was um, kind of like saying, tell your story and shut up. Yeah, exactly. And, and but this also happened in a gradual way because of some of the first truth commissions, like the South African Truth Commission, actually did let people tell their complex and complicated stories. But often when people do that, they don't talk about the things that the truth commissions want them to talk about. So these mothers instead of saying exactly how the son was beaten, how the son was taken away by the military, you know, um, what kind of uh, um, exactly happened, recounting that trauma over and over, which is really what the Truth Commissions wanted. They wanted a recounting of the trauma, presenting themselves as victims, but without talking about any of the social forces that were involved, without talking about political movements, social organisations. Just me as an individual mother had my son killed, and I want whoever killed that son to apologize, right? That was the kind of way it happened. But when it was first happened, when the truth commissions first came out, often they would tell these long stories and they didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about their lives since they'd lost a very special loved one. They wanted to talk about um, uh, the, the, the political context and what they thought of the new government. There was all kinds of things people wanted to talk about. But what the truth commissions did was they, they sort of had the protocol that narrowed and narrowed people's stories down to the point where all they were really telling was individual stories of victimhood. And in the end, there was most people felt, with the exception of one or two here or there, I think the Guatemalan Truth Commission was somewhat of, a, um, of an exception um, in that it's still allowed to, you know, people to talk in more collective terms. But mostly what these truth commissions did was take people's individual stories and give a sense that the stories had been heard and therefore we can move on. Now, what you've discussed is the idea that truncated stories tend to strip out these collective and political aspects, uh, kind of the bottom up aspects. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that's all you get is, is, is a couple minutes, two minutes or five minutes to tell a story if you're on a panel or what have you. And now I've learned that you can tell a story. You can, you can tell a story that touches somebody's heart, but it's hard to do. And, and what is your, what do you, what advice do you give to somebody who has just a very limited amount of time? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I've seen some of the, for instance, the domestic workers who rejected the curated storytelling, who said, I'm not going to tell my story anymore at the legislature or to the media because they take it and they twist it and turn it all around and it ends up not being my story. Um, and what I've seen the domestic workers and even the dreamers do is tell these alternative stories. Now, they don't have to be great long, you know, stories like in, in the last chapter of the book, I actually look at the Venezuelan stories, some of which are about you know, stories told in the Mission Cultura in, in, in Venezuela in the early part of the Chavez government. Um, some of those stories are 70 pages long. And I think there's something to link. There's something to just giving people the time to tell their story and take the space they need to tell their story. Um, and, and that's what I look at in the last chapter is these uncurated stories and what they look like. But um, in terms of time limits, I've seen domestic workers and dreamers tell a story in five minutes or 10 minutes, um, tell a poem, do a video story that gets to the heart in that very short time of who they are, of their experiences, of the situation they find themselves in. Now, um, often these stories like the, um, a, a story by a, a dreamer on, on a website called Dreamers Adrift, and, and sorry, he doesn't even refer to himself as a dreamer, but that story is mostly a critique of the idea of most of the kinds of stories that are told. He says, I don't want to refer to myself as undocumented because I've never thought of myself that way. I've just thought of myself as a community of people who have been battered around by America. And that's how I grew up. And, um, and so I think that these kinds of stories can be told in even in brief formats. Um, and that's what, you know, I've seen that many of these dreamers and, um, and domestic workers do in a, in a sort of in the aftermath of these campaigns. 
Um, but the difference is that they're not being directed in the same way by protocols, by legal formats, by being told. And, and here's, I mean, for instance, one of the, the figures I talk about in the book is Marshall Gans, and he came up with a whole training manual of how to tell your story that's been reproduced. I, I live in Australia now, and those training manuals are used by all kinds of organizations in Australia for telling their stories. That's how far his global toolkit of storytelling has traveled. Now, he uses this idea of the story of self, us, mm -hmm. and now. now. What is that? So it's, it's kind of his idea of connecting... Um, it, it was very much tied to the development of, of storytelling in the Obama campaign. And it's, 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 it's different to what I was talking about before with connecting to communities, with connecting to politics. His is very much about things like what kind of values does something like an electoral campaign promote? Often it's very neoliberal values of, um, of family and, um, and um, country. So there's very nationalist narratives of America. That's, that's the kind of values when he talks about the story of now and the story of us. That get, those are the kind of collectivities Gans is talking about. He's talking about very nationalist um, kinds of uh, collectivities and conservative kind of collectivities of family, which is different to what the dreamers and the domestic workers are talking about when they see themselves as part of a broader collectivity of, um, of, of organized communities. Um, but Gans, in addition to the story of self, us, and now, also has this narrative of, um, also has this formula for telling a story. And this formula is one that's been adopted very broadly, which is, you know, talk about your, your, who you are and your crisis point, then relate that to a, to, um, a choice that you made. So for instance, you know, I'm a poor black person who comes from, this uh, area, I, I wanted to be an engineer, but I couldn't because I couldn't get into school. That's when I realized and made the choice to vote for Obama. And so that formula of this is my scenario, this is my point of crisis, that's the choice I made. The choice is always some narrow goal. Vote for Obama, vote for the DREAM Act, fight for comprehensive immigration reform. These are always the kinds of trajectories of the stories. And they all, you know, for the election, Obama election campaign, they had to fit into two minutes. Um, so what they were ultimately doing was taking these very kind of complex and layered life experiences that people would tell when they first arrived at the Camp Obama training workshops and they'd tell these very, you know, um, heartfelt stories. And then the GANS trainees would say, okay, that's your story, now fit it into this mold. Um, and that's the problem for me is that that's a difference between the two minute story and the, the video storytelling by the dreamers or the poem told by, um, you know, a domestic worker who wants to talk about, you know, the sort of global violence of imperialism and how that has what has caused her to have to leave her homeland and come to the US. There's a big difference between those two types of storytelling. So, so what would you advise somebody to do if they're being coached by one of these story workshops, which you mm -hmm. talk about in your book a lot, or by Marshall Gans's people, mm -hmm. uh, or a, some kind of a nonprofit or foundation that is looking to, Take, make it a very minimized st personal story that mm -hmm. fits the neoliberal trope. Right? That's yeah. a word you use. What is a trope? So a trope just means the kind of underlying stereotype that um, is embodied within a story. So for instance, with the domestic workers um, stories that they told, they often told uh, the story of, the poor victimized domestic worker and the individual bad employer, right? Now, if we tell a, if we use a, a so-called trope or a stereotype of an individual bad employer, that makes us think that, oh, there's only a few of them, right? Like most employers are good. Most employers treat their domestic workers well. We just have a few here and there bad employers. Um, and so therefore the whole system is fine as long as we can fix these few bad employers. Now, um, this was also a, a, a trope that was used within slavery to say, well, you have a few bad slave masters here and there who treat their slaves badly, but overall, most slave masters are well-intentioned and good. Now, today, we look at that and we say, no, slavery was a horrible institution that dehumanized people, dehumanized employers and employees, and just was a terrible system. That's what we would say today. And similarly for domestic work, it's not that we have a few bad employers and a few good employers and we just have to get rid of the bad employers. It's that the 
global domestic work industry is one based on exploiting the vulnerabilities of people coming from debt-ridden third world countries. And until we recognize that broader systemic problem, we're not going to solve the issue simply by pointing out a few bad employers. So um, I, I've got another question I want to ask. I want to do another uh, show ID first. Uh, but then we're going to talk about how this might apply to women telling their stories about sexual assaults. Yeah. Okay. So this is the Rob Call Bottom Up show. And I'm going to pause for the radio interview. And my guest for this show is Sujatha Fernandez. She is the author of a new book, Curated Stories. And she is a professor of political economy and sociology at the University of Sydney. Uh, so, and the book is, is about how stories are being abused, really, and misused. And the people who are asked to tell them are ending up telling shortened stories that leave out some of the bottom up most important parts of the stories. And, and I, 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 how would this apply to women telling their stories about being sexually assaulted or abused? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, we're actually seeing somewhat of a turning point today with the storytelling, because I think on the one hand we did, we have had this era of the neoliberal curated stories, but I actually see somewhat of a change coming with, for instance, the Me Too movement. Um, where people are using social media, where they're coming out in different ways to tell stories of, of um, sexual violence and sexual harassment um, and, and to link that into a broader campaign, a broader social movement and political campaign. Um, so I actually uh, have hope for, um, for these kinds of stories because not only are they stories that are, um, people are being you know, empowered to tell that they're coming out, that, that the stories that are previously silenced, but they're linking it in through the Me Too hashtag, through the kind of communities of people that are forming across racial lines, across class lines. Um, they're actually uh, tying into what I see as, as, as a broader collective movement that is very different to the kind of individualized um, legal campaigns and, and other forums through which, you know, the, the kind of stories I'm talk, talking about have been told. So you're talking about the medias through which the stories are told. I'm sorry? You're talking about the media through which the stories are told, in a sense. I guess so. I mean, I, I'm definitely interested in the impact that different media have, right? So, for instance, if somebody tells a story to a reporter from the New York Times and the New York Times reports that story, that's one particular kind of reporting of a story. If somebody goes on, on Twitter and uses a thread to tell a harrowing re report of some abuse that happened to them, that's a very different kind of story. And it's one in which, okay, sure, it's shaped by the word limit of, of say, Twitter. There are various constraints there too. But... Nevertheless, it's, it's being told um, with a different parameter in mind, and particularly when it's linked into a hashtag movement that is saying, you know, women will not be silenced anymore. We're not going to hide these kinds of abuses that we face. We're going to speak out together. And the fact that women are emboldened to do this because they see other women doing it. Um, there's something very strong and powerful there about, you know, the sort of building up of a social movement that Me Too has much more in common, I think, with um, even though it's, it's received so much of its support through, through social media networks, right? And we, we all know the limitations of social media, but nevertheless, I think there is a space opening up there for telling a different kind of story than simply campaigns like the Bill of Rights campaign, which relies on mainstream media, which relies on legal channels and legal networks in order to, to get their stories out. Well, I think one thing that really interests me is, is you're, you're referencing the Me Too hashtag. Mm. And what that's doing is it's putting a name on it. Yeah. And, it's, and, and yeah. when you say the Me Too hashtag, that just is, is basically a button that, that opens up all kinds of stories that we know about. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. seems like maybe what would be valuable is to identify hashtags for these other movements and uh, uh, that would, uh, when just using a word or two, signify mm -hmm. that whole collective connection and, and a lot of that kind of stuff. So does, does that make sense? 
I mean, I think it makes sense, but um, to me, rather than a sort of technical solution to the issue of storytelling, I think, yeah, there's definitely ways that hashtags can help. But to me, what it ultimately comes, what it ultimately comes from is the willingness of people, whether it's through a hashtag, whether it's through social media, whether it's just out on the streets like the mega marches of the migrant rights movement did. It's just people coming together to realise their broader um, uh, social uh, kind of connections and, and struggle. And it's from that, that desire to build power outside of, um, you know, the sort of channels, the, the institutional channels like the advocacy nonprofit organisations, like the mainstream media, that's where I think it, it's really powerful. So, for instance, the, the example I look at in the last chapter of Venezuela is to me, one that comes out of very strong, organized, grassroots, barrio-based movements. Um, and it's those movements that kind of precede the storytelling, because I think sometimes storytelling is seen as like a Band-Aid solution that, you know, well, well, let's get people together and get them all to tell their stories. Whereas the difference with the testimonials, the difference with the feminist movement, the farm workers movement, the barrio movements in Venezuela was, in some ways, those movements came first. The work of building power on the ground of building those movements came first and the stories naturally evolved out of that. Um, we can think of things like, you know, for me, I've always been interested in, in cultural movements. So things like the civil rights song movement, the hip hop movement in Cuba, which raised issues of race, all of these things didn't sort of weren't, you know, um, planned in a way by technocrats or by people from above, as you said earlier, they came, they came sort of through organized networks of grassroots movements. And to me, um, in my all the books that I've written and I've thought about culture and the relationship between culture, politics, social movements has always been that um, um, the two have to be intertwined. And when you take away the, the, the building power, the social struggles, you're kind of left with only one element. And if stories is the only element, then it's naturally going to be sort of co-opted into the mainstream order. Wow. Yeah. So what would you advise people who are being squeezed into these molds? Um, I think so. I, my solution and thinking about this is broader than, you know, um, being able to come up with a, with a sort of suggestion for people because I would, you know, I, I would think that in the end, getting out of those kind of scenarios is probably the best thing. And, and so, for instance, with the domestic, the domestic Workers United, DWU is the name of the organisation, um, after going through this Bill of Rights campaign, after realising the ways in which their stories were used, not to benefit them, but to benefit, you know, middle class advocates and organisations, their solution was simply to reject um, that whole kind of politics and say, we're not doing the sort of middle-class led advocacy organizations anymore. And what they did was they, they restructured DWU as a worker led movement. And they said, we are taking control of this. We're rejecting funding. We're not taking funding from the Ford foundation. We're going to try to, um, to self fund, to raise community funds through fundraisers and by drawing people into our movement. And the whole idea was to totally restructure the organization and in restructuring the organization in trying to build one that was more focused on base building, on drawing other domestic workers into the movement, focused on the grassroots rather than focused on the institutions at the top, they also fundamentally rethought how they tell stories and they started telling different kinds of stories. They said, now we're going to just sit around and tell stories around a kitchen table. We're going to share our individual personal stories with each other. We're going to do plays. We're going to do poetry. We're going to do performances. We're going to do an oral history archive, right? So all these creative ways, suddenly when they moved away from the kind of, you know, massive million dollar Ford grants that say, okay, here's money if you go and do a campaign that involves advocacy storytelling, when they ha didn't have these outside middle class people dictating and telling them how they should run their movement, they suddenly opened up all kinds of possibilities, both for their political organizing, their campaign strategy, but also for the ways in which they told stories and the, all the options open to them for doing that. Well, I, I can relate to that because you know, I, I have a nonprofit uh, new, news and opinion site, opednews.com, which is uh, for, kind of left of progressive. And uh, I found that because of the issues that we cover and the way we cover them, we we don't get any 
institutional funding. We don't get foundation grants mm -hmm. because we criticize Israeli policy and we criticize Democrats. So we touch on taboos. And it's, and it's so, you know, it's, it, it, if we tried to walk the line of what it would take to get foundation funding, mm -hmm. we would not be who we are. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality. And, and so I can see how what you're characterizing it in, is, is this, I, I, I think of monster movies and a, a hulking mm -hmm. shadow that threatens people that to attempt to tell their real stories. Mm -hmm. And what right. it, it's like a vampire sucking the life out of their stories and what they're left with is, is a bloodless, lifeless form of the mm -hmm. story, really. Right, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, you also in the book talk about how, uh, when it comes to story structure, you know, most people think about American stuff. And there are other cultures and other kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you, you, at one point, you talk, you raise the issue that some people talk about how, how the neurobiology of stories and the anthropology mm -hmm. of stories. And I've talked about it. I've said that I think that we evolved and our brains literally evolved to process stories. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you don't think that? Well, I do. I think, for instance, you know, when we, we look at all different cultural forms throughout history and the ways in which, um, you know, people have narrated their lives, I've given shape and form to their experiences by, um, uh, talking about them by telling stories about them. I, I absolutely think that's true and, and fundamental to human experience. What I'm criticizing there is the ways in which those experiences are all packaged into the one thing and seen as somewhat equivalent across time and space, which I don't think they are. I think that we have to understand the ways in which stories function in very different ways in different countries, communities, cultures, and and that's what I'd like you to talk about now. How, yeah. how are they different in different cultures and countries? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not, that's not something I've studied in, in any great depth. But, um, I, you know, what I've observed is that often um, most studies of storytelling come from the U.S., right? They are all from the Western experience. So most studies of storytelling kind of come from the Western experience and, and impose the Western uh, sort of label or, or experience of storytelling on all stories, imagining that they're all the same. Um, now, you know, often that's described as, um, like Jerome Bruner is one of the very well-known sort of um, writers about storytelling who says, well, you know, all stories follow the same idea. You have to have you know, a problem in order for a story to be interesting and compelling. That problem has to reach a conflict point that conflict point has to reach a climax. And then once you have that climax, then the story is resolved. That's seen as the formula for storytelling. And often people just present. Well, that, goes back, that goes back to, to, to Aristotle and Ars Poetica. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and that's often presented as the universal storytelling model rather than a Western storytelling model. So like in, for instance, in some Japanese storytelling models, there's no conflict. The story simply goes along with certain twists and turns, but they never have the problem, the conflict, the way the conflict is resolved. Um, you know, I, um, uh, my parents are from India, and when I used to visit India as a child, I'd sit with my grandfather and he would tell me a story about um, an ant that took a grain of rice from one corner of the room to the other. And he would go on and on, and then it came back and it took another grain of rice and it put it in the corner. And this was his whole story. It would last for like five minutes, and that was the story. There was nothing that happened in the story. But it kind of is my point of how um, often when we go to different kinds or we understand the ways in which different kinds of cultures tell stories, they don't always follow that same model. We don't always have to have a conflict and a tension and a result of that tension in order for something to be a story. Um, and so I think more sort of appreciation of that and, and a sense of... Um, how what we and the functions of stories in many cultures stories are very interwoven in everyday life activity so when i was writing the chapter on afghanistan i was looking at you know both the curated stories being told in this workshop but also how are stories used there there's songs there's folk tales all these stories are very intertwined they're not just things that people will tell as a form of leisure they're actually intertwined with everyday and and life events like births and marriages and um and other kinds of rituals so in all of these aspects, in terms of the formula of stories, in terms of the purpose of stories, the use of stories, 
we find great variation in different parts of the world. And often by imposing the Western model as a universal model, we flatten out this kind of complexity of, of, of how story to what stories are. Now, one of my favorites I've, I've got fat fascinated with it was, is uh, the hero's journey or the monomyth. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, yeah. Campbell popularized it, but even before Campbell, it was known as the monomyth. Uh, and that has that pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think that's a very American kind of a thing. But also Campbell said that it was something that existed in, in a thousand cultures. That's why he, he, he called mm -hmm. his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Mm -hmm. But Doug, Doug Rushkoff uh, has written about how the, the, the narrative is changing on stories so that there, there's no longer an arc really. Yeah. and where he says it's going and it's the way we see it in like a story like the game of thrones and in a lot of video games is it's more the world mm. and i think that's what you're saying is missing in a lot of these stories too really yeah yeah and and so but i think it's hard because people are not used to that i i think people born after 1980 who grew up with video games they are mm -hmm but I think that that's a different kind of a story. It's a really different kind of a story. And maybe, <clears throat> maybe the idea that it is the emerging new form of story might make it easier to sell to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the organizations. Do, do you think that these organizations are, have a, a, a kind of a, a malicious intent in stripping all this out of the stories? Not at all. I mean, I don't think so. I think they just have a different strategy and their different strategy is, and they've, you know, articulated this is, for instance, with the domestic workers and dreamers, their strategy, you know, these advocates say we are in a very difficult political situation. One could argue even more difficult today. Um, these uh, undocumented workers and students have very little legal standing in this country. They have, it's very difficult for them to organize openly um, given all the obstacles they face, it's just easier for them to use the media, to use the legal institutions. This is the best path they can, they have right now. And so they narrow their vision, they narrow their, um, their, their what they see as a possibility for social change um, down, whittle it right down without really taking into account what the workers and students themselves want. It's like the expert coming up with the diagnosis of the situation and, and, and suggesting this is the best way forward. And I, sim I think it's just a difference in political strategy. A lot of the domestic workers I talked to had come from, you know, Maquiladora strikes in Mexico or had been part of student movements in Trinidad or, you know, they'd come from, um, from anti-dictatorship movements in the Philippines. And they said they had a much more expansive vision of what was possible and the kinds of futures they want to fight for. And, and, and we've got to wrap. So what it sounds like what you're saying is that this workshop, the story workshop movement is teaching a model that, yeah. that is not very effective, that's disempowering, and that can actually hurt activism. And people yeah. have to look at those story workshops and make sure that they get their stories out. Okay. So any last words? Uh, no, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. All right. So my guest for this show has been Sujatha Fernandez, professor of political economy and sociology at the University of Sydney and the author of Curated Stories, The Uses and Misuses of Storytelling. Thank you so much. Thank you.